Next morning, we were awakened by cockerels crowing and the sound of the talking drums. We were living near the equator, where without fail every day, it was light at 6 a.m. and dark at 6 p.m. The drum beats were heard at 5.30 a.m. and could be heard all over the village. Bandimi, Boyaka, Nandako, Nanzambi. Believers come to the house of God. This was the signal for us all to make our way to the morning service and to begin each day by worshipping God. After attending the service, we had breakfast of papaya and pancakes, and then we were given a tour of the mission station. At the far end was the school building and dormitories for two or three hundred children who came from villages away upriver and some from villages deep in the forest reached by narrow forest trails or by canoe along small rivers flowing out of the jungle. A path behind our house led to the dispensary chapel, the dispensary building, a mud house which served as a labour ward, and another mud hut to house the postnatal mothers and babies. Various other mud-walled thatched roofed houses were homes for people who worked on the station. In the immediate vicinity at the back of the house, there was a chicken house and run, a small brick cookhouse and our toilet. The children used to come to our house to sell us eggs. For a while, we were very grateful and blissfully unaware of the fact that we were buying our own eggs stolen from our hen house. We just had to admire their initiative. The toilet was a place I became very wary of. It was a small brick-built building with a thatched roof. Inside was a wooden box-like construction with a hole in the top and a lid to cover the hole when not in use. Under the box was a deep pit, so deep it never needed to be cleaned out. I thought of it as the bottomless pit. One day when sitting on the seat, I became aware of movement to one side of me. I turned my head and there was a snake with its beady eyes looking at me. It was hanging from the roof by its tail and swaying to and fro past my ear. I froze for a second. Then, regardless of my state of dress, I flew out of the door and left the snake to keep possession of the little house. To my dismay, one day I reached out to pick up the toilet roll, only to change my mind when I saw a large hairy spider with its long legs wrapped round it. I was to discover to my discomfort that the toilet was home to a multitude of cockroaches. When I was sitting on the seat, I kept feeling something pricking my legs. I discreetly mentioned this to someone and was informed it was the cockroaches hiding under the seat. From that time on, I never sat down on the seat again, finding other ways to do what was necessary. Inside our house were three large rooms and two smaller rooms. The small rooms were on each side at the back of the house and built over the veranda. On one side was the kitchen and on the other side was a bedroom for James. It was partitioned off to make a room which served as a bathroom. The bathroom contained a tin bath and a little table with a jug and wash bowl. Before the evening meal, it was the custom to take a bath and change our clothes, which were damp with perspiration due to the humidity of the climate. The tin bath was also used to wash the clothes. The ironing was done with a heavy charcoal iron. It was filled with charcoal, then set alight and swung backwards and forwards until the charcoal was red hot. Then one could begin to iron with a thing like a small fire in your hand. Not an easy task. Our houseboy did most of the ironing, but I did help now and again. All the clothes hung on the washing line had to be ironed. There was a fly which used to lay its eggs on the washing. I never found out why it chose to do this. The problem was that if the eggs were not killed by the hot iron before the clothes were worn, the little mites hatched out, buried themselves under the skin and grew there into little grubs. One day I noticed a spot on James's leg with pus in it. I squeezed the spot and out popped a little thing like a caterpillar. We soon discovered we were sharing our house with many forms of wildlife. Cockroaches in drawers and cupboards, lizards ran over the walls and we used to put a finger on their tails and they ran away leaving their tails behind them. Ants loved anything sweet. 
We soon got used to putting ants in our tea along with a spoonful of sugar and then scooping out when they floated on the top like tea leaves. As soon as dusk arrived, out came the mosquitoes. Our house was not mosquito-proof, so the only way to avoid being bitten was to go to bed and hide under the mosquito net. We could not, however, escape from the incessant whining noise they made. We had to take a daily dose of chloroquine to prevent us from taking malaria. We had our own jungle pest exterminator firm. One day, our house was cleared of cockroaches in a very unusual way. A column of ants emerged from the forest and headed towards us. They marched up the steps and went into and through the whole house and took the cockroaches away with them, back to their ant hill in the forest. Our African friends told us to stand well back and let them get on with the job. It was an amazing sight watching the upside down cockroaches with legs wriggling frantically in the air, being carried away on the ant conveyor belt. The column was about 12 inches wide and was kept in line by the soldier ants on either side of the column. I soon became accustomed to the insects, even the hornets which used to dive down on us like kamikaze pilots, inflicting a sting like being stabbed with a red hot needle, and the scorpions which scuttled across the floor now and then. There was one fear which never left me, however, and that was the fear of snakes. They lived in the thatched roof and occasionally came down into the house, sometimes lying across the threshold of the door as a living draft excluder. The top of the veranda railings was a favourite place for them to sun themselves, sometimes only inches from the heads of the children playing there. One day I decided to do some spring cleaning. I cleaned up the kitchen thoroughly and decided to move the table round for a change. The table was originally placed with a long end against the wall. I sat at the other side of the long end with James and my husband Hillis sitting opposite each other at the narrow ends of the table. I changed the table round and put one of the narrow ends up against the wall and set places at the table. This time, Hillis and myself would be sitting opposite each other at the long ends and James was to sit on the narrow end facing the wall. Why am I explaining all this? I called Hillis to come for his meal. We always sat as a family at the table for meals. So Hillis said, I'll go and bring James. For the first time I said, no, he's asleep in his cot. Let him lie a bit longer. We finished our meal and Hillis reached out to pick a banana from the huge bunch hanging from the ceiling above the table. Suddenly, a three foot long snake dropped onto the middle of the table. It swiftly made for the end of the table where James would have been sitting. Momentarily, we looked at each other and then simultaneously made a speedy exit from the room, each using a different door. If I had not moved the table, the snake would have landed on top of me. And if we had brought James to the table, the snake would have made straight for him. Some of our African friends caught and killed the snake, and we all thanked God for his wonderful guidance and his protecting hand upon us. <laughs>